All right, yes, thank you to um, Jody uh, for, for explaining to us and demonstrating, and actually all of our, all of our uh, speakers this morning as well, um, how metadata is used, not just from Crossref, um, but from uh, PubMed and from all the other sources out there, um, but just demonstrating all of the implications of um, missing or incorrect um, uh, or, or a misrepresenting metadata downstream. And thanks to Bianca for mentioning um, the blog post that Alice wrote about how we should be striving at least to be working more closely together. And that actually segues really nicely into Metadata 2020. Um, a couple of years ago, I'm obviously at Crossref, um, I realized that uh, even amongst our members, which are obviously primarily publishers, although more on that after the break, um, there are so many different types and so many different opinions um, and so many different ways of thinking about metadata. Do they even talk about metadata quality internally? How do they talk about that? How do they um, understand and um, prioritize improvements to metadata? Um, so we started uh, researching. Um, and we interviewed 20 or so people um, from across the whole community. And it became very, very clear very quickly that we had to be doing something outside of just Crossref. We had to be talking to, of course, our usual friends, ORCID and data sites and others uh, like that, but also to librarians, to researchers, to funders, and to data repositories. Um, and we found that... Um, many of them were saying the same, expressing the same kinds of challenges. So we realized that we should put together this broader uh, collaboration um, outside of Crossref um, to start to um, allow these groups to share those um, experiences with each other. And that hadn't really been done before. There's lots of talk about metadata amongst librarians or amongst publishers, but never really together. Um, I'm going to thank Ravit, who's coming on... Um, uh, after Claire for this talk. We're just copying your title. This title, this talk is so meta. Um, so, I've explained a little bit about that. Um, this is one of the quotes from those early interviews. Metadata is the means to the end, not the goal. So we need to demonstrate the importance of the interconnected whole. Um, just a little note about standards, because everyone immediately thinks about standards when you hear metadata. Um, this collaboration is not about standards. This is a funny, funny quote. They're like toothbrushes. Everybody likes the idea of them, but everybody wants to use their own. <laughs> a little um, odd. But this one might be more familiar. Um, of course, we have so many metadata standards out there. So what we don't want to do is have a big chat amongst ourselves and come up with yet another metadata standard. Um, what we'd like to do is create a dialogue between the communities, between the different metadata communities. So what is Metadata 2020? It's a collaboration. I'm not clicking. Yeah, the green. All right. I've been telling speakers all afternoon to use the clicker and not taking my own advice. <laughs> so Metadata 2020 is a collaboration that advocates richer, connected, and reusable metadata for all research outputs to advance scholarly pursuits for the benefit of society. Okay, so richer metadata fuels discoverability and innovation. Connected metadata bridges the gaps between systems and communities, and reusable open metadata eliminates duplication of effort. Um, so I'm going to hand over to uh, the next two speakers, also from Metadata 2020. Claire Dean actually is the best person to talk about this. We hired her as an outreach manager, thinking we had to go out and encourage people to talk about metadata. But actually what happened is um, she was inundated with the requests from, I think, about 140 people now and about 85 organizations. So she's going to tell us a little bit more about what those community groups have been doing and the projects that they're working on and some of the deliverables that these people working towards. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the last time that I um, spoke on behalf of uh, Metadata 2020, I started out by saying thank you and welcome for coming. So hopefully I won't be talking backwards through the rest of this presentation, but if I start to just look at the slides and we'll, we'll be fine. Um, 
So we, the story so far, so um, I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about each of these later, but we started out with 18 interviewees and kind of early advisors um, help, who helped us um, shape the idea of Metadata 2020. Uh, we realized that we needed to really expand um, and kind of reach out to all kind of areas of the scholarly communications community. Uh, we launched in September 2017, uh, inviting participation from anybody who had expertise and willingness to um, volunteer their time. Um, and I think within a couple of weeks, we had at least 40 participants from across scholarly communications, 40, 40 volunteers. Um, and from that, we formed um, these different community groups that, that Ginny just mentioned. Um, to start with, each community group uh, met monthly in 2017 and really started to discuss the core challenges and opportunities within their specific community when it, when it uh, comes to metadata. Uh, these are kind of the, the community groups, as, as Ginny mentioned, publishers, librarians, platforms and tools, data publishers and repositories, funders and uh, researchers. Each has a, a group chair who's been responsible for kind of um, shepherding the, the community groups. And they've changed over time, uh, but have been doing a fantastic job in, in kind of getting that, that, um, that the groups up and running. Some of the example problems that came up were things like from researchers. Metadata en entry upon submission of research takes time, and this metadata is often required to be entered multiple times. Uh, our publishers cha are challenged with establishing streamlined, efficient workflows for metadata management due to siloed expertise and unclear prioritization within organizations, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, so we have a variety of, kind of example problems that came up. Um, and what we did was we had each community group um, formulate a, a problem statement or a community group statement where, wherein they um, charted down, uh, listed out each of their problems from their communities um, and also potential opportunities to collaborate. Um, from there, we took all of, all of that information, all of the information from our uh, early interviews, all the feedback from um, speaking opportunities and um, workshops and that kind of thing, and identified some core common themes across the community groups um, of things that people were um, concerned with and created six really closely related projects, which we launched in March of this year. Um, so we switched our focus from our community groups to cross-community projects. Um, these project groups meet monthly, do some offline work, um, and uh, in the last couple of months we've uh, formed a couple of uh, in-person two-day workshops to advance and accelerate some of that, uh, some of that project work. Uh, the projects um, that, we're, that we're working on are the first being uh, researcher communications. Uh, I'll speak to all of these in more detail shortly. Um, metadata recommendations and element mappings, defining the terms we use about metadata, incentives for improving uh, metadata quality, best practice and principles, and metadata evaluation and guidance. So we have a very um, broad remit, but all of these projects are incredibly closely related. Um, so the first for, uh, two projects are, are closely related, metadata uh, mapping and, and evaluation. So firstly, we, Jim Swainston from Emerald uh, Group Publishing leads this project. The purpose is to converge communities and publishers towards a shared sec of, set of recommended, uh, recommended metadata concepts with related mappings between them, uh, those recommended concepts and elements in important dialects. Uh, this is the most complicated project for me to explain, <laughs> but basically uh, when everybody you know, recognized we're using all these different schemas and, and that there's different terminology for different things within those schemas, um, the group members felt that it was really important to have a way to navigate between those schemas. So they've been taking the most prominent schemas within scholarly communications and mapping uh, using a, a core set of elements to map between those. Uh, project six is kind of closely related to that project. It's taking, uh, it's looking at all the different sources of metadata evaluation and guidance that are out there and helping people navigate those, um, that, that guidance. Uh, most of that um, guidance is related to the schemas that are being mapped in, in project two. Um, in doing so, uh, this project is also identifying where there might be potential gaps in evaluation uh, tools and, and guidance um, with a view to potentially creating new resources. 
Um, that's one of the things that's, that's come out primarily out of Project 2, but also a few other places in, in Metadata 2020, is um, this idea of a metadata flow diagram. Um, it's uh, basically the many of the, t the group members uh, would like to create a um, comprehensive me metadata flow diagram that shows the journey of metadata through scholarly communications um, as an interactive tool for people to help navigate um, navigate the, the, the schemas and the different ways that um, uh, workflows and tools and systems interoperate. So it's a, it's a massive project. It's only just um, begun, um, but they're looking at that now. Um, so the second kind of set of projects is um, kind of best practice, principles, and definitions for metadata. Um, project three, defining the terms we use about metadata, led by um, Scott Pluchak from um, the University of um, Alabama, Alabama, Birmingham, um, that group recognized, um, as I mentioned earlier, that there are all of these different ways of talking about the same piece of metadata um, and that there are lots of, um, and, and, the, and the reverse being true as well, um, and decided that, that the industry or the, or the uh, community really needed uh, a glossary to help navigate those terms and also kind of set a recommended uh, terminology for the most commonly used elements. So they've been taking the schemas from project two as they've been mapping them, looking at which terms are most commonly used um, for a particular element um, and also uh, have been working with um, Another project, which I'll talk about a little more later, you see it's all very woven together and difficult <laughs> to explain, but um, uh, another project's been looking at creating uh, surveys for researchers and uh, others throughout scholarly communications, um, po uh, partially to see how they, what, what kind of terminology they use when describing metadata. Um, share, shared Best Practice and Principles project is led by Howard Ratner from Chorus and Jennifer Kemp from Crossref. Um, and they are working to build this high level set of principles for using metadata across um, Skullcoms um, in order to kind of facilitate that interoperability. Um, they have um, already uh, collected existing best practices and principles and published those online to help others navigate what's already out there. Um, they've, um, and they are in the um, process of creating this best, best practice and principles guide, um, hopefully to be published by the new year. Um, and then finally, there's this kind of outreach side of the projects um, in researcher communications and incentives for improving metadata. The researcher communications project is looking um, to find ways to align um, efforts between communities who are talking to researchers about metadata. So we've kind of recognized that, that everybody's talking with researchers and ex communicating with researchers about metadata using completely different language, um, different um, explanations for why it's important. Um, and so this project is really um, focused on trying to find kind of consistent core way to communicate with researchers. Um, and to start that, there's been a lot of research um, being done. Uh, they've, um, they're conducting a literature re review, research around metadata, conducting surveys and interviews of researchers and others in scholarly communications. And um, they're also beginning um, kind of the early conception of a, of a larger campaign to researchers surrounding uh, metadata. Uh, the incentives for improving uh, metadata quality is kind of the, the outreach element of, for all of the other communities, basically. Um, and it's um, highlighting the downstream applications and value of metadata for, for all of the other parts of the community, telling real stories um, as evidence um, of how better metadata will meet their goals. Um, so they're looking at things like charting big benefits of improving metadata, looking at different kind of roles and personas within scholarly communications and helping um, kind of sort and filter the different um, benefits and incentives for those different roles within scholarly communications. Um, this is a little bit about the survey subgroup. Um, I think we kind of mentioned that earlier. Uh, we, and then we've been... Um, We've had a couple of workshops, as, as I mentioned, Th this fall. We've had, had between 20 and 30 Metadata 2020 participants at each, one in New York, one in uh, London. Um, and these were two-day workshops. 
that worked really well. We were able to accelerate a, a lot of the project work incredibly quickly. Um, so we'll be looking to do more of them. This clicker isn't working. Oh. Um, okay, but I think we're at the end anyway. Um, so um, I think the last things I just wanted to mention are that um, we invite any participation in any of these projects. If you have a, spe a specific um, interest or expertise in any, of the, in any of these projects, do let us know. Uh, we do have a lot of participants now, over, as I said, over 140. Um, and um, if you uh, are able to kind of follow us on Twitter, spread the word, we're going to be producing more and more resources, more outcomes from these projects over the next few months and onwards. And um, it would be great if, if you could all share those. Um, and finally, uh, we, I will be leaving Metadata shortly, to Metadata 2020 shortly, to go and work for PLOS. So if any, uh, if any of you kind of um, know of anyone who would like to be our commu community engagement lead, um, please do get in touch um, with Ginny or myself. Okay, and I think now we're handing over to Ravit. Okay, so this is me, and I'm here this afternoon um, to talk about um, the elephant in the room, uh, to confront it at least, uh, metadata. Um, I would like to thank um, uh, Jenny and Claire who worked with me on this uh, presentation um, to, to, uh, uh, and to be here today. Um, I also want to thank uh, the Scholars Portal folks uh, who uh, in a very last minute helped me to put up uh, a poster uh, that describes the uh, life, life cycle of metadata in our different services. Um, so you're welcome to, to look at it. So uh, this is my roadmap. It was documented by Google in 2015 when I was walking to the corner store. I actually live around the corner from here, and this is my street. And. Um, and actually, last time the ebook uh, in Scholars Portal discussed this particular event, we figured that there's another person on the ebook team who was documented by Google in 2015. And we're kind of wondering if there's a conspiracy uh, theory of some sort behind it. But, but seriously, what I want to talk about today or uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes or so is to take us through the most um, uh, the most significant and recent metadata endeavor um, that I, I was part of, which is um, a new ebook platform that we launched um, in Scholars Portal. And after that, I would like to focus on some metadata pain points that I came across uh, during the work and I, came across, and I come across daily. And then I'm going to move about, uh, to discuss uh, my work um, in Project 6 and Project 4 in Metadata 2020 and why I find uh, the work in uh, both projects uh, closely associated with what I do on, on my daily, uh, during my daily work. And finally, I hope to tie it all together to, to discuss how uh, metadata can be improved, um, can be improved by, by um, um, contribute to community and, and working group uh, across and, and beyond the workplace. So I want to start by um, discussing um, Scholars Portal new ebook platform. And um, to those of you who don't know, Scholars Portal is a service of the Ontario Council of University Libraries. And we provide many services in addition to our ebook service. Um, you can check our poster. And through to Friday, uh, we have 414,853 titles, commercial titles on our platform, open mostly to the universities uh, in Ontario. Um, for some ebooks, like the Canadian university presses that we have on our platform, we actually the only hosting platform, so we provide access um, 
also to universities across Canada and in the US. And um, you can see on the slide the side, um, the metadata side of our ebook service. So the side that you can see, just because this, the, we couldn't, I couldn't capture it in a slide, so I'll have another slide for that. But this is basically the, the, the interface of the metadata, and you can see that we're trying to capture uh, not just identifiers, but what type of identifiers. So librarians are very interested in um, understanding if an ISBN is print or online, and it's a very challenging um, um, uh, issue when, when we deal with metadata for ebooks, especially. Um, we try to capture uh, other identifiers such as DOI, of course, and um, we also have the usage terms for readers to understand what, what they can do with the specific titles. Uh, we have the flexibility to enforce uh, ebook deals at the title, subject, series, or collection level, and for each title we aim to offer the richest metadata possible. Uh, and sometimes it means that we have to write a loader that takes metadata from three different sources uh, and combine it together to what you, what you see in the slide. Because one will have just one ISBN and another source will have ISBN and DOI and another source will have uh, just the title and the author and a, an obsolete ISBN. So in cases like that, we just need um, to go with, one, with more than one um, source data to actually uh, achieve rich, rich metadata. And um, surprisingly enough, I, I selected a metadata title to demonstrate um, our platform. And this one, No. I'm stuck. Um, well, I'm stuck on this platform, I'm just uh, on this slide, I'm just going to say that the other half where you see the plus and the minus is basically the online reader. Okay. So, yeah. So, what do we need to do to move to the next? Still this? Okay, perfect. Go back. Okay. So, basically, we take PDFs and we outflow them as HTML. And this is uh, uh, another title, but from the reader. Uh, from the online reader uh, side of, of the screen. Um, we also have chapter downloads and um, PDF extracts. It all depends on the deal and what publishers or, and aggregators allow us to do. Um, and again, another very random title that tells us that metadata may be more revealing than content. So. If you look at our search, um, at our search, you can see that um, we basically try to capture um, every possible metadata field that's out there for eBooks, um, from title to um, to affiliation to um, even chapter titles. If you're looking for a specific chapter in a monograph. Uh, and so our entities-based search can, can show you um, all the values um, that we basically index and that you can search on. And um, getting to this point was obviously not easy because, again, the metadata does not exist in one source. Uh, it, it's an aggregated process in many cases. Um, we receive metadata in various formats and we basically um, map it and or normalize it um, um, to, the, to the bits format, which is uh, the new uh, sibling of JETS. Um, we heard about JETS uh, in the morning. Um, it's the book interchange uh, 
tag suit is uh, it was actually published in 2016 we're using uh, already version 2 and it is um, intended to provide a common format in which publishers and um, archives can exchange final book content including book parts such as uh, chapters so it's a very very uh, detailed format uh, it's a, what what people call green XML, so there are many ways to use it as a standard. Um, because we are an aggregated service and we draw our metadata from various resources and receive books from over 30 providers, uh, it usually have more than one product also. The challenges with having quality metadata are obviously tremendous. Uh, we get metadata at a very low level and a very high level. Everything adds, needs to end up in a bits format on our platform. So how do we deal with that? Obviously, we have many challenges, but I would like to talk today a little bit about um, um, three main categories of pain points um, uh, that we, we encounter here and during um, my work um, in, in various uh, working groups uh, that deal with metadata. So the first one is uh, validation of metadata according to specific standards or schema isn't necessarily an evidence for quality metadata. And that's usually a misconception that uh, uh, we find quite a lot. So I sent you uh, validated bits. Fine, but bits in order to validate needs only a title. So it doesn't mean you sent me metadata, you sent me a validated bits file. Um, there are many, as we know, every standard has optional and recommended and mandatory um, entities. And so they're all being used differently. Even publishers who do send us bits, their bits doesn't look like our bits. The second concept is, or the second um, category of pain points is that concepts are represented in different ways within the same standard and across standards. Uh, the, most heavy, the most, I guess, common one would be publication date. Independent of any standard, I'm sure you can agree with me that the concept means the date in which the content was first made available to readers. But the concept carries very different meanings when a standard um, recommends specific entities to express this concept. Is it the print publication date? Is it the online publication date? Is it the date when the EPUB 3 file was updated in the system? Is it the date when it was first deposited in our repository? Then beyond the concept, there are the representation of publication date. Um, it was mentioned a little bit earlier this morning by one of the speakers as well. Are you using an ISO standard to put the year, month, day? Are you gonna, are you gonna put the, the year first or are you gonna put the day first? What, in what way you're going to deliver, to deliver the value for, for uh, your entities? Another, um, Another biggie for conceptual recommendation uh, is monographic series. I found at least three definitions that other people know in the field of monographic series. And the catalogers in the audience may want to tell me that the Library of Congress already published a clarification about it. I know. I don't think anyone in the ebook industry read it. So that's one thing, the concept. It lives independently from standards. But try to find a title of monographic series in the metadata. I created some visualization of the probability uh, of finding a title of monographic series in the metadata. And it looks like that. So, number three, the last one. 
There is not enough attention to the context in which metadata exists, how it is received, shared, used, enriched, corrected, distributed, its entire life cycle. Most of us are very, very dedicated to what we do for the, for the right reason. Uh, we are experts in our field, and sometimes we're just not aware what's happening to the metadata we're using before it comes to us and after it leaves our, our place. Um, I want to delay a little bit about the, con the, the third concept, why context is so important. So the first reason is that at each stage uh, in the life cycle of scholarly content, uh, metadata has different functionalities. Take, for instance, KBART. KBART is an inventory list that's supposed to help you compare holdings. Correct? Anyone disagree? But for the last time, KBART is not a standard for bibliographic metadata. You do not use it as bibliographic metadata because then you make so many catalogers in the academic libraries so frustrated. The reason being, it was not meant to, to be used as such. But when someone take KBART and use it as the source for their bibliographic metadata, there's the, a ginormous impact on the entire life cycle of this metadata and where it ends up and how incomplete and inaccurate it turns out to be. The, others, the other issue that is, um, is extremely significant when we talk about context is cases of overwriting metadata by various distribution channels and duplicate work that are common due to the complexity of how metadata is being shared and published. I'm going to read to you a short example of a case that's pretty real and common in, in our workflow of what it means to overwrite metadata in a constant way just because we are not aware of what's around us. We're not really familiar with the context. So a publisher sends a bibliographic record to a service like ours. After a while, we realize that the, pub, the author's last name uh, is misspelled. We fixed it, right? We fixed it on our platform, and then we want to share it with our partners, schools in institutions in Ontario, and this, uh, providers of discovery layers that universities use as well. Um, we, we send a new, a new list of our holdings with the correct uh, name. Sorry. Okay, I'll get to it in a minute. Um, and then, after a while, the catalogers who are using uh, our books going to OCLC to take records from OCLC to load into their ILS systems so they can have our holdings. They don't load our records, but they compare and prefer OCLC. But the OCLC records were deposited by the publisher, and so the publisher title has an outer with a misspelled name. So there, when they load a record, even though we fixed it, they actually overwrite it with the original arrow. Meanwhile, at the provider of a discovery layer, our records are matched against authority records to be stored in databases that would be used by, by institutions and universities as their discovery layers. Our records are not authority records. Authority records come to providers of discovery layers from Library of Congress, and of course, they are the highest hierarchy. So again, we send a record of this book. We have the right or the correct author's name, but the authority record coming originally from the publisher, being deposited and finding its way to the Library of Congress has the wrong name of the last name, as, as, a, as a last name is spelled. And so, surprisingly enough, once again, the error of the author's last name 
gets to overwrite the fix that we created in our platform. So um, this is why I think it's extremely important to know what others are doing with metadata and to familiarize yourself with, with war, other people's workflows. Uh, what you see on the slide right now is basically, I also chair a working group, um, an ISO working group. Um, we work on uh, creating best practices for ebook metadata. And this uh, chart was, was um, or poster was provided by one of the members when we were trying to understand the workflow that is typical to a publisher, an aggregator, a librarian, and so on. And when we took this exercise and we asked everyone to chart their workflows, it, it struck me that I, I wasn't aware of so, so many things. But when I saw the workflow, I realized that when I sit in the library and I think, oh, they should do this, they should do that. Why are they fixing that? Why are they sending that in the right format? How, how hard it is? But then when you look at someone else's workflow, you understand that others have other needs that they can change due to their um, specific uh, work and environment. And so it's ex extremely important, I find, to be familiar with that. And this one, I guess, is, is, a, very, is a very complex one, but most of the stuff that we saw were pretty complex. I lost it again, I think. Oh. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Metadata 2020, uh, I'll talk mostly on Project 6, although Project 4, who looks at use cases, um, is something I'm also involved in due, due to the redesign of the ebook platform in Scholars Portal and the experience we have with, with um, uh, loading ebooks with so many different uh, source data. Uh, but Project 6, Metadata Evaluation and Guidance, uh, the chair is Ted Haberman. And the purpose, as um, Claire already said, is to identify and compare existing metadata evaluation tools and mechanisms for connecting the results of those uh, evaluations to clear cross-community guidance. Uh, so phase one that uh, just ended in October 2018, pretty much now, was to collect information about evaluation and guidance tools. We created a grid um, together with Project 5 uh, based on a detailed environmental scan that was done by people from different disciplines, different fields in scholarly communication. The idea is to collect what exists rather than come up with new resources. And I'm going to show you Emory University uh, as one of the resources that we collected as an example. Uh, just to, to uh, mention briefly phase two, which we're going to start shortly, pulling together resources and trying to generate an outline of evaluation system for integration with submission systems, assessing the quality and completeness of metadata against different metadata standards, and identified methods and tools uh, to, measure, to measure consistency and accuracy of metadata. So Emory University is a resource that was created four years ago. Um, and basically, it's one of the most comprehensive uh, resources that we put in our grid. The reason being, it starts with a list of 18 elements. It links to detailed definitions of those elements and then maps the elements to 11 different metadata dialects or standards, if you will. So this approach includes elements of the conceptual framework of Metadata 2020 that we're basically trying um, to follow in our work, which is understanding the community needs, uh, preparing recommendations or concept, uh, look at implementations, and provide guidance. And that takes me to why, why get involved in metadata initiative is so important. Um, I learned uh, that each time I join a working group, um, which in a library world we call service, 
I, I do provide service, but I, I, I also learn a lot and it improves my, my daily work because I'm being exposed to things that in my very narrow niche and, and daily challenges, I can't see what you would call the big picture. So, um, so when it comes to metadata, we're still experiencing many pain points that, uh, that need to be addressed and the only way to do it is to communicate and create environments where we can actually identify and analyze and come up with possible solutions, but also, again, uh, get to know each other's needs and understand the constraints and the workflows and everything that comes with the life cycle of metadata. The other thing uh, is that I really think that uh, when it comes to metadata, we're all stakeholders at one level or another. So everything that we can do in order to, to change uh, or to, to work out the pain points that we're all familiar with uh, can be done um, by, by, again, communal work that, that we do in our profession. Um, I want to offer a strategic thinking, maybe, to think about um, how to improve metadata from the point of our daily work and what we do as professionals, combined with um, the need to join a working group and to do um, uh, an initiative such as Metadata 2020. And the first one is connect by sharing resources and working in collaboration across communities. One can review examples and implementations in different standards in order to identify gaps in requirements for certain entities. So again, only when you map 11, 18 standards you understand where you at. And before that, I don't think we can say much about the standard, but our very private needs. The second one is collect. By reviewing many use cases uh, of how structures, elements, definitions are being used to describe content across standards, platforms, and disciplines, one can create best practices and guidelines that harmonize with existing recommendation, documentation, sorry, and workflows of all parties. Um, metadata is not a field for big revolutions. It's, it's the fine um, details, uh, the tweaking, uh, and the patient to see what is needed and how we can make it more effective, uh, but we cannot throw everything that's been done and say, okay, we'll come up with our own standard, with our own schema, with our own guidelines. Um, same goes to, to the work we're trying to do in ISO when, we, when we're drafting right now the recommended practice for metadata, um, ebook metadata. Uh, we try to take into account the needs of publishers, uh, aggregators, jobbers, uh, librarians, all the stakeholders, understanding that we all have different needs and some of the things need to be there because there's no other way for people to perform their, um, their work in any other way. The last one is contextualize. Uh, by learning about the context in which the metadata is used, one can develop criteria for the assessment of metadata quality that could be applied to various stages in the life cycle of metadata and eliminate duplicate work. And that takes me back to my emphasis of context as something we all need to be um, uh, tuned to in order to avoid duplicate uh, work and in order to avoid the over, over uh, writing of metadata. So that's pretty much about it. I would like to thank you. And um, META is also a word in Pali, which is the, the language uh, of the Buddhist sutras. I'm sure 
some of you may have heard of it. And so it means um, meditating on love and kindness. I think we could all use some of that. So I am wishing you very, very uh, well and meta for the rest of the conference. So thank you. Now it's on. I know some of you are involved in the Metadata 2020 projects. So any comments are welcome as well about your experiences in this collaboration. People are feeling the jet lag. <laughs> okay, I understand that.